And I will take 15 minutes of your time to convince you how important it is to monitor the oxygenation, not just the systemic oxygenation, but also the cerebral oxygenation. This is my big conflict of interest. This is a sponsorized lecture. Now, um, basically, uh, measuring the cerebral oxygenation is something on which over the last decades we have put a lot of effort in terms of uh, research and also economic uh, uh, efforts in the neuro ICU and uh, in the neuroanesthesiological uh, context. And uh, there are mainly three types of uh, monitoring which can be used uh, to assess the cerebral oxygenation, which are those that are here represented and are the jugular bulb oximetry, the tissue oxygen probes, and the cerebral oximetry. Now, I'm going to give you some uh, very quick information about all the devices, but then I will focus on the cerebral oximetry because this is the only uh, type of monitoring which has the advantage of not needing any neurosurgical or any invasive uh, uh, intervention in the patients. So, which is the rationale? So why do we need to monitor the cerebral oxygenation? The oxygen saturation depends on the metabolic rate of the oxygen. So this is the formula. This is the cerebral metabolic rate of the oxygen, and it's directly correlated to the cerebral blood, blood flow and the difference between the delivery of the oxygen. So the content of oxygen in the arterial component and the content of the oxygen in the jugular, so in the venous component. So let's imagine a situation like this. This is a healthy patient. This is the arterial component. Here we have 100% of saturation and here we have the extraction, because you know that the brain has a very strong and very quick metabolism and then tends to extract a lot of oxygen, much higher in terms of quantity compared to the other organs. Um, generally, when we then observe the saturation of oxygen in the venous component, so in the jugular, is around the 75%, so there is an extraction of about the 25%. But let's imagine a brain which is suffering. Uh, what does it do? It tries to extract even more oxygen because he needs fuel for optimizing his metabolism. So in this case, uh, what we see is that there is an increase of extraction of the oxygen. And if we go to measure the venous, thank you, the venous component of the oxygenation, we find much lower values. Now, which is the problem of this technique? As I told you, it's quite invasive and we need to be very careful in, in uh, inserting the probe in the right position because if we put the probe not not too distal enough, what we can get is an extracranial contamination of the fascial vein and what we are seeing is just a general saturation, not the cerebral saturation. Uh, over the last years, we are also starting uh, to use uh, another type of probe, which is the PBTO2 probe. This is a Clark electrode, which basically measures the interstitial oxygen. So there is a flux of oxygen in the extracellular compartment. Very easily, the neurosurgeon puts the probe, generally together with the ICP probe, and this measures the cerebral oxygenation. Obviously, it's accurate, but the problem is that you need to, to make a, a, a hole in the brain of the patients. So obviously, this is not completely feasible in any kind of contest in general ICU or in the perioperative settings. But we have available the NIRS. The NIRS is quite easy. It's a bedside, easy available, safe, absolutely safe tool. The concept is quite similar to the SGVO2. So there is a source of light here. It can be measured bi bilaterally. And, uh, um, the biological tissues basically contain uh, a number of pigments which absorb the light at different, uh, um, at, different, uh, at different numbers. So basically, the NIRS is able to assess the amount of oxygen which is related to the hemoglobin and is able to tell us the cerebral saturation. Compared to the jugular way, you can have a bilateral assessment, so both the hemisphere can be assessed, even if it's just for in not the whole brain, but just a part of the brain. And compared to the PBTO2, is bilateral, so PBTO2 is a focal evaluation of the oxygenation, whereas veneers can provide more global and bilateral information. The concept on which we have to consider the values of veneers are basically 
based on the pathophysiology of what I've discussed you so far, so the cerebral metabolism of the oxygen. And we also have to think about this formula when uh, we look at the number on the, on the monitor, because at the end of the story, the, problem, the important thing is not just to monitor the patient, but is treating the patients in order to avoid the cerebral complication. So what we see, the number that we see with the NIRS is the cerebral oxygenation, and it depends on the cerebral blood flow, we said, and on the content of oxygen in the blood. So, so episode of cerebral desaturation can be related to different factors. First of all, a reduction of the cerebral perfusion pressure, which reduces the cerebral blood flow very easily. Second, it can be related to a reduction of the systemic oxygenation, respiratory failure, for example, a reduction of the PF values, Third, I can have a problem in the content of the oxygen, so in the transport, so maybe my patient has anemia, maybe my patient needs a transfusion. Then there are some specific situations where you have a, a damage at the level of a brain-blood barrier, and you have a, you, this creates a sort of barrier to the diffusion of the oxygen. This is typical of some types of uh, pathologies like the cardiac arrest. And uh, actually, it's, it's, very, it's a situation which is very difficult to be damaged, and generally we treat it trying to increase the cerebral perfusion pressure and both the content of, uh, of the oxygen. This is an example of uh, the effect of manipulation of the arterial blood pressure on the cerebral oxygenation. Here we have uh, a patient with uh, low cerebral perfusion pressure and low cerebral oxygenation. This is a patient in this specific case uh, with a vasospasm, uh, and this is a CT perfusion, which demonstrates an area of penumbra, so an area with low flow, but preserved or increased cerebral blood volume. What we did in this case was to increase the vasopressors. Increasing the vasopressor, increasing the cerebral perfusion pressure le led to a concomitant increase of the cerebral oxygenation. And this is, is still in this patient, the relationship between the cerebral oxygenation and the cerebral perfusion pressure. So in, may, in most of the cases, despite uh, the other pathophysiological mechanisms that we will discuss in a second, they basically go together because CPP is the major determinant of the cerebral blood flow. So first message, be careful about the cerebral perfusion pressure. If you see an episode of the saturation on your monitor, that could be sorted or resolved by manipulating the arterial blood pressure. In subarachnoidal hemorrhage patients, in fact, what we have learned that, uh, is that when you have a vasospasm, the first thing and the only validated thing is actually increasing the arterial blood pressure. In this study, this is the big study which demonstrated that the Triple H therapy can be just substituted by hypertension. What did the authors do? They induced hypertension alone or together with hypervolemia and hemodilution, and they noticed that the effect on the cerebral oxygenation was exactly the same using only hypertension alone. So no hypervolemia, no hemodilution, especially if we want to improve the cerebral oxygenation, but let's push up on the pressure. Second point, second key point, we talked about the respiratory failure. What's the relationship between cerebral and systemic oxygenation? Unfortunately, the, relation, the relationship is terrible because what we found in this retrospective study is that when you have a PF below 300, which is quite common, especially in the ICU and in the perioperative settings, you already have some episodes of cerebral desaturation. And the more are the episodes of desaturation that the patient experiences, and the worse is the outcome, because cerebral desaturation is associated with increased mortality and poor neurological outcome. And the other point that we found in this physiological study is that one size does not fit all. So we know that there are different thresholds according to different uh, studies about cerebral oxygenation. Someone says that the cerebral oxygenation for PBTO2 is 20, for veneers uh, is uh, from 50 to 60. It really depends on the study. What I tell you is that it really depends on the patient because in this case, what we found out is that the patients who are older than 60 year old have a much lower tolerance to the oxygen. So my point is that if we have to individualize the treatment of our patients, we have to use a monitor who can help me to individualize the treatment.
Third point, we mentioned about the transfer, the presence, the transport of oxygen. So we mentioned about the hemoglobin. Unfortunately, especially in brain injured patients, the target, the optimal target of hemoglobin are not completely clear. There is now a randomized control trial, which is called uh, TRAIN, who is uh, comparing seven versus nine of uh, hemoglobin in brain injured patients. But so far, we don't have uh, the results. We only have uh, physiological studies, and what we have seen from uh, these physiological studies is that episodes of cerebral desaturation can occur more frequently when the values of HB are below nine grams per deciliter. So, this is something that should be considered. Personally, I think that uh, cerebral oxygenation is something, is a tool that has to be integrated in the clinical context and together with, our, with other multimodal modalities. Uh, I am a neurointensivist as a training, and during the COVID pandemic, when I couldn't manage neurocritical care patients or neuroanesthesiological patients, I did what, uh, what I can do. So I used the neuromonitoring tools in the, COVID pandemic, in the COVID patients. And I found out that even in general ICU, in general anesthetic patients, the episodes of the saturation and the derangements at the level of the brain are extremely, extremely high. We can have a lot of neurological complications even in non-primary brain injured patients. And that's why we need to use non-invasive monitoring like the NIRS or like the transcranial Doppler. In this uh, observational study, what we did was, uh, for example, to monitor uh, the COVID-19 patients during the rescue therapies, so during the recruitment maneuver, during prone position, during the using of uh, carbon dioxide removal, uh, during the administration of nitric oxide. And, uh, what we found out, well, not surprisingly, this is what was already observed in previous study, is that the changes of systemic saturation were directly correlated with the changes of cerebral oxygenation. So, in general, if you have an improvement with a prone position or a recruitment maneuver of systemic oxygenation, you might have a good effect even on the brain. But because we have learned that cerebral oxygenation is not only related to the systemic oxygenation, we have to, be, to go a bit more deeper in the details about, about the cerebral physiology. An example, here during recruitment maneuver, we had an increase of systemic oxygenation, but we had a decrease in cerebral oxygenation. And why is that? Because measuring non-invasively the intracranial pressure, we had a very high increase of, of ICP and a very important reduction of CPP related to ICP increase. When we used instead the prone position, we had a systemic optimization and increase of uh, the, the oxygenation, increase of arterial blood pressure, and so both the components oxygen and CPP were maintained very high, and we had excellent results on the cerebral oxygenation. Last example, carbon dioxide removal. We used it very, very often. But using carbon dioxide removal, we have to be very careful, because what we noticed here during the uh, activation of this technique was a sudden reduction of cerebral oxygenation. And why is that? Well, a quick, a too quick reduction of the CO2 levels might potentially cause vasoconstriction and therefore create episodes of cerebral desaturation. So we use them even if uh, we could not imagine the presence of such important possible complication at the level of the brain. Another component, another point is the concept of autoregulation. Again, this is the autoregulatory auto curve that we study in our books. I'm sorry to tell you that the reality is not this one. We don't have this wonderful autoregulatory curve, especially in brain injured patients. This is more similar to the reality. Each one of us has his own autoregulatory curve, and unfortunately, it changes also over time. So what we have to do is uh, to individualize, again, our treatment, because if I give my patient a 55 of a CPP, it can be fine for this patient, but it can be very bad for this patient here and this patient here. So we can use basically two ways to assess autoregulation. One is the testing. 
testing means that I do something to the patient, I manipulate the arterial blood pressure, and I see what happens to the cerebral blood flow or a surrogate of the cerebral blood flow. The other way, which is quite more physiologic, is the dynamic autoregulation, which basically uses the changes of arterial blood pressure and uses an output which is a surrogate of cerebral blood flow and creates a correlation coefficient between the two factors. Now, we tried to assess the effect of autoregulation in this study compared and together with the cerebral oxygenation because the two things go together. Altered autoregulation reduces the tolerance to cerebral oxygenation. You might know that passive leg rising test is a, a daily test that is used to assess the fluid responsiveness, but its use is quite challenged in brain injured patients because someone thinks that might be detrimental for the brain. So we started to do passive leg rising tests, and then we started to do norepinephrine infusion and a fluid challenge. And we obtained these results. The three groups, passive leg rising, fluid challenge, and norepinephrine, did not differ in terms of CPP. So the blood pressure was basically increased in the same amount. The intracranial pressure measured non-invasively was basically the same, no statistical difference between the group. But the cerebral oxygenation was importantly reduced in the group who underwent passive leg rising test. And why is that? It's because the autoregulation was mainly impaired in this group of patients compared to the other groups. And the NIRS is able also to provide an index of autoregulation, which is called TOX, and it, which is based on the relationship between the arterial blood pressure and the changes of cerebral systemic oxygenation. In this context, it's good because Compared to other techniques, it has a very good uh, spatial and temporal resolution. You can keep the nears as well as the transcranial Doppler for hours, if you want, for days. It has a good spatial resolution compared, for example, to other methods like those based on the intracranial pressure, and it's absolutely safe. This is the first study which demonstrated the feasibility of the nears to create the U-shaped curve, so to create the arterial blood pressure optimal at which the patient is autoregulating at its best. There are obviously some limitations, and the major one is uh, the venous contamination because uh, the incident photons penetrate the skull and takes some information even from the venous part, and I think this is the part on which we have to work more. My conclusions are that uh, systemic and cerebral oxygenation are importantly correlate. Desaturation in the brain are associated with worse outcome. So we need to start to monitor the brain. We have uh, different techniques. Uh, I think that the less invasive is better. NIRS has no contraindication, to be honest. You only need a bit of uh, thinking regarding the pathophysiology of episode of cerebral desaturation because there are different factors that can affect the cerebral oxygenation. It's a promising technique not just for the assessment of the number itself, but also of more sophisticated numbers and factors like, for example, the autoregulation and can be done at the bedside. Thanks. Uh, we are going to talk about lung ultrasound, which is no longer a new echographic technique. I've been speaking about lung ultrasound for many years, and the very first years were quite difficult because there was uh, rather some skepticism from the scientific and clinical community. But now it's very different. This is my disclosure. So actually, we know very well, and especially after the COVID pandemic, that we can very nicely use lung ultrasound to assess patients, critically ill patients, especially in two clinical pictures, patients with acute dyspnea and patients in shock hypotension. And this is because lung ultrasound can tell us if the patient have an acute heart failure or if there is an acute pulmonary embolism or is there is a pneumothorax or there is an ARDS or in case we found a pneumonia and the patient is in shock, we can infer that there is a situation of sepsis. Of course, here lung ultrasound is useful only when the sepsis is due to a pulmonary cause, not to other causes. And we can use this tool for both the assessment, first assessment and diagnosis, and for the monitoring of our patients, as well as for prognosis. 
So actually, what happens when we are called to see a patient, for example, a patient with acute dyspnea, if you are very good, we can also do some echocardiography, some focus echo. Uh, we have a patients with non-specific lab tests or we don't have the lab test results yet. And I would say that in this case, independently of what you see in the heart, so the patient may have a severely reduced ejection fraction as in this case, but the patient can also have a preserved ejection fraction. If you see multiple diffuse bilateral B-lines on the chest, so on both sides of the chest you have a lot of B-lines in more than one side, you can actually uh, think that your first suspicion of acute heart failure is very, very probable. If you don't find the multiple diffuse bilateral B-lines, even if you have a severely depressed ejection fraction, actually your diagnosis of acute heart failure becomes very, very unlikely. Of course, we never have 100% sensitivity and specificity, but it's really, really strange that a patient with acute dyspnea without uh, B lines on the chest has an acute heart failure. And please um, take note of these three adjectives. The B lines must be multiple, so many B lines. So usually we consider at least three in one space, but when you have real acute heart failure, you have so many. They must be diffuse, so you don't have to find them only in one spot of the chest, and they must be bilateral, because also normal patients or even in COPD, you may have a few B-lines here and there, but not multiple, not diffuse, not bilateral. If your first suspicion is not confirmed by lung ultrasound, lung ultrasound can still be very useful to check for another cause. As we have seen before, you can find pneumothorax, you can find signs of pneumonia, you can find a pulmonary infarction, uh, and so you may suspect a pulmonary embolism. Here, of course, the cardio uh, assessment is even more important than the pulmonary assessment. And this is why even the um, European Society of Cardiovascular Imaging has recently stressed the importance of combining the cardio and the pulmonary assessment together because this makes your evaluation very strong, especially again in patients with acute dyspnea and hemodynamic instability. And this is uh, the, the main concept that I'm trying to stress. You have to integrate cardiopulmonary ultrasound because it's true that the heart assessment will tell you the etiology of heart failure, but it is the lung assessment which will tell you whether you have heart failure or not and the degree of heart failure. Again, you may have a patient with 10% ejection fraction, completely stable, optimal medical therapy with no acute heart failure, with no bilis, with no other signs and symptoms of heart failure. So the heart itself is not enough to make a diagnosis of acute heart failure, and the lung can really complement this evaluation. And you can also use these tools together for patients in acute circulatory failure. So this scheme comes from Daniel Lichtenstein, which is considered the father of lung ultrasound. And uh, this is a quite schematic uh, approach, but it is very powerful because if you have a patient in shock or hypotension and you have a probe, uh, you can start from the subcostal view. And if you don't see a large pericardial effusion with signs of tamponade, you can actually exclude that the patient has a tamponade because the patient is in acute shock. So the, the cause must be very clear to you. From the same subcostal view, you can also assess the right heart. If you don't see a dilated right heart, you can actually exclude that the patient has pulmonary embolism. Again, the patient is in shock, so the, the reason, the cause of the shock must be very apparent in lung ultrasound. So one scan, and you will have already excluded two of the main causes of, of shock. Then you go to the lung, you assess the apex of both lungs. Do you see the lung sliding moving? Yes, you can exclude also pneumothorax. You don't see the lung sliding in a patient in shock, you can actually rule in pneumothorax as the cause of shock hypotension. You go on, you haven't found the pneumothorax. Do you see the multiple diffuse bilateral B lines, so the B profile? You can rule in cardiogenic shock as the etiology of uh, your problem. If you don't find 
uh, not even the bilateral multiple diffuse B lines. At this time, you have an A profile, so you don't have B lines, you have a lung ultrasound pattern of aerated lung. You can try to give fluids to your patient, and in this case, the two main scenarios are either septic shock or hypovolemic shock, and you can also, of course, assess the response to fluids and to see whether the patient develops B line or not. Again, this is a very simplistic approach, and of course, you are not going to use only lung ultrasound and cardiac info. You have a lot of other information, but this is very powerful and very quick. In a couple of minutes, you can at least exclude some of the main causes, um, life-threatening causes of shock. And how does this approach help us? So why should we use point-of-care echo in these patients? Mostly because it helps us saving time. So there are extensive data on that. This is one of the main study. If you compare patients treated, evaluated by point-of-care ultrasound or patients evaluated in a standard approach, the mean time needed to arrive for the right diagnosis is about 25 minutes for standard care, and it, uh, sorry, it's 24 minutes for point of care echo, and it's about three hours for standard assessment. So the main point here is that lung ultrasound for diagnosis saves time. And another point where lung ultrasound can be very useful is in the differential diagnosis of cardiogenic and non-cardiogenic edema. Again, you're not going to do this differentiation only on the base of lung ultrasound, but if you have multiple diffuse bilateral B lines which can be present both in cardiogenic and non-cardiogenic edema, but then you see the distribution of B lines which is very regular, homogeneous in cardiogenic edema and is very patchy in ARDS and you see subpleural alterations, small consolidations, larger consolidations, which are present in ARDS, but are not usually present in cardiogenic pulmonary edema, you can really have a big help in your differential diagnosis. Monitoring, this tool can be also very useful for monitoring. Because, for example, in heart failure, we have a significant decrease in the number of B-lines after diuretic therapy, and we can count somehow, we can semi-quantify B-lines and see and monitor the decrease after diuretic therapy. And this is important also because B-lines are very dynamic. So if we compare B-lines to uh, other non-invasive parameters that we have in echocardiography to assess congestion and hemodynamic congestion, such as pulmonary artery systolic pressure or EONI prime, we need much more days to see a significant change in EONI prime or pulmonary pressure, but we may need sometimes even after 20, 30 minutes after diuretic therapy to see a significant change in b -line. So b -lines are much more dynamic. And also, this change in the b -lines after diuretic therapy is very different from patient to patient. So there are patients in which we see this change after half an hour. In some patients, we don't see any change in hours. So this is a very important to give you indications on how the patient is doing, uh, if probably you have used uh, not enough diuretics or the patient is also dehydrated. So you have to integrate this, but it's really useful to monitor uh, closely after initiation of diuretic therapy. And you should continue this monitoring until discharge because we know that when we send home patients after hospitalization for acute heart failure, still with B lines, so still with subclinical persistent congestion, these patients are going to come back very soon with a new exacerbation of acute heart failure. And this concept of persistent signs of congestion before discharge has been highlighted also in the recent European guidelines on heart failure. So send your patients home when they don't have any more B lines, not when they are fine and no more dyspnea. And we can use these also in patients with dialysis. So we uh, start to have um, quite a lot of data about that and we can monitor our patients before and after dialysis. Again, let's integrate 
cardiopulmonary ultrasound here, and we can somehow do a kind of forest classification of our patients. We used to do that with the Swan guns. We cannot put the Swan guns to all patients. We can do uh, a proxy of that with our probe, congestion with B-lines and perfusion, for example, with the time velocity integral of the LVOT track to have an index of stroke volume and the perfusion of your patient. Can we monitor patients not only with heart failure but also with ARDS and more complex situation? We can do that. We should consider uh, that we have mainly three big lung ultrasound patterns and we give zero to the irated or over irated lung. We give one if we have B lines less than 50% of the screen. We give two if we have more than 50% of the screen with B lines. And we give three if we have a consolidation. And there are tons of data about the use of the lung ultrasound score for patients with ARDS, for example, to predict successful extubation uh, or also to assess the risk of overdistension. If you start with a patient who already has quite an irated lung, of course, the risk of overdistension is higher. Again, you don't use only lung ultrasound, but this is very important to monitor and visualize the degree of aeration of your patient together with all the other indexes. And of course, this has been used also in COVID-19 patients. This is just one of the main studies that we have. And you can see that you can monitor a degree in the lung ultrasound score, uh, which is different from the ventral to the lateral uh, parts of the lung in patients in prolonged prone position. But again, this is a tool to visualize the changes in pulmonary aeration of any of your patients. And this is why it is not quite accepted that lung ultrasound can be used to measure recruitability or monitor recruitability, again, among other parameters. Don't use lung ultrasound in isolation, especially for monitoring. Of course, we have some limitations. Uh, if you have a very obese patient, lung ultrasound can become difficult. If you have a lot of bands, pads, uh, tubes, as usually in a patient in intensive care, sometimes you don't find the place where to put the probe, but we can um, turn a little bit the patients. I mean, we can find a way to do a good lung ultrasound. So I think that in the near future, with the expansion of users for echo, not only lung ultrasound, but only heart ultrasound, focus, uh, car uh, cardiac ultrasound, and together with the miniaturization of echo machines, we are going to face a situation where probably almost every physician will have a, a portable machine in his hand and will do a kind of extended physical examination. And uh, this is the idea, of course, we are not going to do everything to everybody, but we are going to assess those organs related to our first clinical suspicion. So, as conclusion, lung ultrasound can be used for the diagnosis, monitoring, and prognosis of patients with both respiratory and circulatory failure. It is better placed as part of a multi-organ ultrasound. So this is not alone to stand in isolation, but at least integrated with the heart. And if you can integrate it also with other organs, for example, with the vexus, which is now very in fashion, but not in isolation. It helps saving time. Uh, we are not sure it's going to provide a prognostic improvement in terms of mortality, but for sure it helps saving time and it's the quintessential clinical ultrasound. So it doesn't replace your brain or medical knowledge. This is very important, especially for monitoring the use lung ultrasound in isolation. We are doctors before being sonographers. Thank you. Thanks a lot for the invitation. It's always a pleasure to uh, talk on this topic. So before I start, let's, I'd like to briefly disclose the fact that I'm the founder of a consulting and a research company, Miko based in Switzerland, where we focus on uh, digital innovations with medical applications. And I'm going to use this uh, survey we did uh, last year and published a couple of months ago in the new uh, open version of the British Journal of Anesthesia as an outline for my presentation. And first, of course, I want to thank not only my co-authors, but all the collaborators from Europe and from the USA who made it possible. 
So we got feedback from over 1,000 anesthesiologists uh, from uh, 20 uh, academic hospitals, both in Western Europe and in the USA. And to the first question, what are your current surveillance strategies on surgical wards? As you can see, most answered spot check, vital sign spot check done by nurses from time to time, usually every four to six hours. Only 14% mentioned the possibility or the use of continuous wireless monitoring. And I remind you, these, are, or these were uh, leading academic institutions, so we can imagine it's actually an overestimation of what's really happening in most hospitals on the planet. And this is in contrast with actually what they wish. Most anesthesiologists said that continuous monitoring should be or should become available in surgical wards and that mobile wireless solutions are preferable to classic wired solutions. It's easy to understand. We all know now that we don't want patients to stay in bed, that early mobilization is a key element of enhanced recovery after surgery. So which variables should we monitor continuously? I find this study very interesting. It was published by the team of Dan Edelson a few years ago in Critical Care Medicine. They looked at the triggers for rapid response team activations. And as you can see, it was mainly a, a high heart rate, a low SpO2, a high respiratory rate, or a low blood pressure. So not surprisingly in the survey, I mean, these, top, uh, these four sorry, um, vital signs were ranked um, top four. So how can we today uh, remotely and wirelessly monitor our SPO2 and pulse rate? You probably have in mind these kind of tools. You probably have one. Uh, I have a few. I mean, they became very popular during the COVID-19 pandemic, but they are not designed for continuous monitoring on the wards. They are designed for self-monitoring, actually for self-checking. And there are more and more studies uh, published uh, showing that indeed they have been useful for uh, self-checking from home uh, during the pandemic. In the hospital, we need different tools. We need, first of all, a sensor that patient can keep all the time, even when they sleep. And more importantly, we need a getaway able to transmit the information to clinicians. We don't expect from patients to self-monitor or to monitor themselves. We want the information to be transmitted to a central station or directly to the smartphone or the pager of clinicians. Could be a nurse, could be the, the ward physician, could be the rapid response team uh, in case of real emergency. For blood pressure, it's a little bit more challenging. Uh, it's a variable pretty uh, difficult to monitor continuously, non-invasively, particularly in ambulatory patients. Still, there are a few uh, attempts, particularly uh, using the pulse wave transit time or the pulse arrival time method. And in the future, we can even imagine to get blood pressure information simply from the pulse oximetry waveform using AI, or more specifically, machine learning algorithm. If you feed an algorithm with a large, a huge, I should say, a number of pulse oximetry waveforms and the corresponding blood pressure values, the algorithm will be able to learn how to recognize specific patterns specific signatures of changes in blood pressure. So such an algorithm has been developed by the CSM in, uh, in Switzerland and tested by uh, Yassine Gamry from the team of Patrick Schottker in Lausanne. So once again, they use simply the pulse oximetry waveform uh, during anesthesia induction and the subsequent tracheal intubation to track changes in blood pressure. And you see that actually it was pretty good. On the left-hand side, you have the changes in systolic arterial pressure on the right-hand side, you have the changes in mean arterial pressure tracked exclusively using the pulse oximetry waveform. So that's possibly what we will have access to in the future. Respiratory rate. As you know, it's possibly the most important variable because that's the most sensitive. You all know that respiratory rate may be, of course, low uh, in case of opioid respiratory depression, but also it could be high in case of respiratory complication or even in case of metabolic uh, complication like uh, lactic acidosis or in patient with shock uh, or in patient with um, yeah, um, any metabolic disorder or including, of course, uh, lactate acidosis. The problem is that uh, respiratory rate is still today uh, the neglected vital sign. 
The level of documentation of vital signs in many hospitals is poor and respiratory rate in particular is often not recorded or poorly recorded. The good news is that many different techniques have been proposed uh, to monitor continuously, automatically respiratory rate. I'm not going to describe them all. I'm just going to uh, show you a few examples. There is an adhesive patch uh, using uh, ECG variability and accelerometer data to compute respiratory rate. It was tested in this uh, study published in anesthesiology uh, two years ago by Martin Breteller from the team of Cork Kalkman. And only 77% of the measurements were part of the safe zones A and B of the Clark Air grid. In contrast, here you have the new portrait mobile system, which is a wireless impedance pneumographic sensor using uh, the so-called dual vector approach, meaning actually simply that the system is computing or analyzing two uh, signals at the same time. So if for any reason, like in this example, uh, you don't get the information from one signal, uh, very likely you will get from the second one. So this is possibly why we got a very nice result in this uh, validation study we published last year. The study was done in Helsinki in Finland. And uh, measurements done with this new uh, wireless sensor were compared with reference capnographic measurements. And you can see that over 99% of the measurements were actually part of the safe zones A and B of the Clark Air grid. One of the key questions, because you understood we start to have more and more options from a technological standpoint to monitor our patients, the real question is to know if it does impact patient safety. At the end of the day, that's what we expect. So to the question, what are the potential clinical benefits of continuous monitoring in the survey? Almost all anesthesiologists said earlier detection of clinical deterioration. It's kind of obvious, it's common sense. If you monitor something continuously, of course, you will capture immediately any change, any deviation. But interestingly, you see that many anesthesiologists also consider it could help us to decrease rescue or rapid response team intervention, to decrease ICU admissions, and even to decrease mortality. And actually, this perception is perfectly aligned with a few studies already published and reporting uh, the clinical impact of continuous monitoring on the wards. So not always with wireless systems, but continuous monitoring on uh, regular wards. These are not randomized control trials. These are before-after comparison studies, so implementation studies. But they are pretty large, as you can see, uh, from the number of patients. And they showed either a decrease in rescue events or a decrease in calls for cardiac arrest or a decrease in res rapid response team events or even one study, you see the study from Sube, reported the decrease in hospital mortality. There are actually a few more studies uh, published um, recently. This one is still in press in the British Journal of Anesthesia. Again, a before-after study, so a comparison of post-operative outcome before and after the implementation of uh, a continuous wireless monitoring system, and once again, they were able to report a significant decrease in the number of ICU admission and rapid response team calls. And it's pretty logic because if you are able to detect clinical deterioration at early stage, you should be able to act, and if you act properly, you should be able to prevent not all, of course, but some ICU admissions. So far, I mentioned uh, mainly opportunities. Uh, I have to, to be fair and to acknowledge that there are, of course, challenges uh, to the implementation of these uh, new monitoring solutions. And for the respondent to our survey, the number one challenge was economic. Of course, we will need to equip regular wards with monitoring systems, which are not existing today. But it's important to bear in mind that if we effectively decrease ICU admissions and hospital lengths of stay, that could be a way as well to, uh, for hospitals to save money. There are very few, as you can imagine, economic evaluations published so far, but there are a few. Uh, this one is interesting. It comes from the US. It's a pretty small medical surgical ward, but they started to implement continuous ward monitoring, and they were able to report savings between $200 and $700 per patient with an hospital break-even after six to nine months. So obviously, uh, at least potentially, these systems may help us not only to improve patient safety, but may be interesting as well from an economic standpoint. The second uh, challenge, at least for the respondent, was uh, connectivity IT issues. 
That's very common. I mean, when we use Bluetooth, Bluetooth connectivity uh, protocols are very familiar to us. I mean, we listen to music with uh, wireless headphones. It's not a big deal we, when, we, when we lose connection for a few seconds. It's not very pleasant, but it has nothing to do with patient safety. As soon as we use similar connectivity protocols to monitor patients, we want to be sure that they are truly continuously monitored. And here you have the example of uh, a study again from the group of Kirk Kalkman. They monitor 22 patients with uh, Bluetooth connectivity. And you see in green, it's actually when they were able to get the signal. So it's done over a seven days period. And in red, it's when actually they didn't get any signal. And so for some patients, obviously, uh, the monitoring system was working pretty well most of the time. But as, okay, as you can see, for other patients, it was clearly an issue. So I don't think for continuous monitoring on the wards, we can rely on Bluetooth connectivity. We need proprietary medical grade uh, connectivity protocols. The third challenge is nurse pushback, or could be nurse pushback. It's pretty obvious. I mean, if you already had the opportunity to discuss this topic with, uh, with nurses, they have in mind existing monitoring systems. So they, they think it's going to beep and, and, and ring all the time. It's going to be a mess. They are really concerned by false alarms, by alarm fatigue. So of course, these systems need to integrate smart algorithm to filter as much as possible uh, artifact and prevent uh, false alarms. We also need, as clinicians, to rethink the way we uh, manage alarm. We need, for instance, to personalize alarm threshold, and we need to accept an increase, a significant increase in the annunciation delay. That is to say, the, the time duration between the detection of an abnormality and uh, the alert or the beep on the pager or the smartphone of the nurse. Last but not least, uh, I was very pleased to see in this survey that very few anesthesiologists think that alarms should be heard and seen by patients, only 12%. To me, it makes a lot of sense. Alarms have not been designed to uh, disturb patients or increase their level of stress. They are for clinicians. Alarms are for us to inform us about clinical deterioration. So they have, there is no place for alarms in rooms, so I think we also need smart monitoring systems able to stay silent, quiet, uh, to let patients recover in a, in a comfortable and quiet uh, atmosphere, and of course, inform clinician either on the central station, in a common center, or on a, on a page or a smartphone. Last but not least, uh, I mentioned continuous monitoring, the possibility to detect clinical deterioration early. That's what we describe classically as the afferent limb of rapid response systems. But of course, we also need an effective efferent limb. That is to say that any alarm, any alert, justified alert, should be followed by an early intervention and a proper intervention. Otherwise, uh, it's not possible to expect uh, clinical benefits. So in conclusion, I hope you are convinced it's time to rethink the way we monitor a patient on the wards. Clinical deterioration may be overlooked for hours. We know that now from many studies. Solutions now exist for the automatic and continuous monitoring of vital signs. They may help us to improve patient safety and satisfaction and to decrease ICU admission and related costs. And with that, I thank you very much for your attention.